very good. So I'm Stan Nelson, and as uh, Wayne had indicated, I'm uh, uh, very proud to lead and help facilitate uh, UCLA's movement into clinical exome sequencing and clinical genomic sequencing, uh, with the idea being to have a series of broad-based genomic tests that facilitate the diagnostic process. And as we heard from a series of the speakers today, there's a whole series of different diagnostic challenges uh, from, on the informatic side, on the interpretive side. But implementing these tools is possible to do now. It's useful to do now. It actually clearly uh, is preferable across <clears throat> a host of different uh, genetic disorders, largely due to genetic heterogeneity and the lack of uh, our patients reading the textbook, as somebody had mentioned. That is, uh, patients don't necessarily clearly come in with a clearly predefined exact uh, diagnosis. And that becomes very challenging for, the, for this sort of diagnostic odyssey that Eric had mentioned that's commonly discussed in the literature. So what I'd like to do is give you sort of the first year snapshot of what we've been doing at UCLA, what lessons we've learned, and give you a couple of case examples that I think are illustrative, or at least are illustrative about uh, how I think of the, the process. So I'm going to skip through some of these slides very quickly, but the human exome sequencing is a sampling of the genome. And it's a targeted sampling, and it's an intelligent sampling focused on uh, technologies and thoughts uh, coming from, actually, from the University of Washington, where, where one's trying to pull out simply the protein coding portions of the human genome, largely because that's where more of the meat is for causing human uh, genetic disorders. We guesstimate, and we guesstimate on a variety of different bases, that about 85% of known of, of disease-causing mutations across the spectrum of genes that are causing human diseases are uh, due to alterations in the protein coding sequence and encoded within the exonic portion of the genome. We, of course, don't know all of the exons of the human genome. We don't know even all of the protein coding sequences yet. And there are instances of deep intronic mutations or promoter mutations that are, that are causal uh, as well. And obviously, there'll be diseases caused by uh, non-protein uh, mutations. But this does a very good job. And my point is that 85% is pretty darn good. And it's what we've been using for clinical diagnostics for quite a long time. It's not really a shift here. And the diagnostic yield only goes uh, up in general. So Hain pointed out the complexity of the, uh, of the analytical workflow. One of the challenges was setting up an analytical workflow that was sufficient and sufficiently clear and sufficiently defensible and sufficiently possible to do on a weekly basis as we discuss new patients uh, on an ongoing basis. So this is a, a calcified process, but it was calcified with a lot of thought going into it, and it'll be altered on close to a yearly basis as we learn new tools. We knew we were making choices. We knew we were making judgment calls about what, how do we align, how do we realign, how do we deal with uh, insertions and deletions. And those are uh, hard-baked within this process, but uh, much of the final end uh, results still require some level of manual inspection, and much of the annotation still requires uh, an expert uh, intervener at the end, which also then sort of, as you saw, gets magnified across a, a somewhat more chaotic genomic data board, and which that didn't represent at all. Uh, it's a very active discussion in the real, in the real world. So a typical exome output, we have to deal with about 22,000 different DNA variants that may be causal. Much of the data can be filtered out and removed largely on the basis of, of allele frequency information or knowledge that a given variant is indeed uh, a polymorphism, is observed in multiple individuals, knowing that allele frequency is critically important for us interpreting the data. One of the things that I love about looking at exome data or whole genome data is that you don't have simply the causal allele or this uh, analytical region that you're, that you're searching for, you actually have the entire genome. So you get a lot of quality information about every single person. And in theory, we get a lot of information that'd be useful for other purposes. But for right now, the point of this is to filter through all the data to generally find that single causal mutation, or maybe two causal mutations. But we get a lot of quality information that assures us that a given exome is high quality data and is useful for this diagnostic process. So we've, uh, it's been about a year, 
since we've uh, uh, formed and vetted the assay and launched uh, clinical exome sequencing as a diagnostic test, where we're sampling that about 1% of the genome that we uh, have strong evidence as protein coding sequence. And we're figuring that if the mutation is within those uh, uh, protein coding portions, we have about an 85% chance of, of observing them. So this is Stan's thought about what this looks like, and everybody has their own vision of this, and it's way more complicated than this. But uh, in general, there's about 20,000 different protein coding genes that we're effectively searching through for the causal mutations. And many of the genes, many of the known disease-causing genes, and everybody will play with this number, in the thousands, 3,000 to maybe 8,000 even, depends on what you call a disease, and it partly depends on what you call a gene, but it's many thousands. And so a fraction of the overall com uh, constituent of the genome has already been proven that mutations in that, in that gene absolutely cause a specific human Mendelian uh, genetic phenotype. That's very clear. Exactly which mutations cause that phenotype isn't necessarily always completely vetted. That's one of the things we'll, we'll struggle with, and I'll try to walk you through a little bit of that. But in general, these genes are sort of classified as cardiomyopathy genes, as we heard one of our speakers uh, talk about. Or they might be muscular dystrophy genes, or they might be retinal disorders. Or, of course, there'll be genes that are both a muscular dystrophy gene and a cardiomyopathy gene, and there'll be genes that are muscular dystrophy genes and retinal disorder genes, for that matter, right? So part of this diagnostic process is, is, uh, is affected by how the patient actually comes to us, right? Did they see a neurologist first? Did they see a neuromuscular person first? Did they see a bone specialist first? And that colors quite a bit the exact phenotypic data that we have. So we took a strategy to be extremely permissive in what the phenotypes are. And that has, as you sort of got a sense from some of the gene lists, that permissiveness creates a very long laundry list of possible genetic targets. We're doing that on purpose to try to be inclusive. So we haven't artificially excluded a disease-causing gene inadvertently. But if a gene is outside of that list, it's still possible to be found. We're not blind to the possibility of, of, of a mutation and our, and our vocabulary, our medical vocabulary, not being sufficiently uh, linked. So this is what a requisition looks like, and as uh, Nagme was uh, begging people in the audience, please fill it out, please put specific information in, that's uh, critical here. Uh, it requires simply a blood draw, it needs to be at least a milliliter, but that's more than sufficient genomic DNA for this. Uh, the turnaround time may get to be very short into the, into the future, not the near-term future, but typically it's in the order of a few months, which is fairly typical for these sorts of uh, panels. Oops. So, this is a snapshot of what these data look like. So of all the cases that we've looked at uh, so far in the first year, we're, we're a, a very clear diagnosis. That is, it's a, it's a variant, it's a rare variant, it's a mutation, it's a compound heterozygote, it's a homozygote that can be convincingly demonstrated in the literature to be causing a given genetic trait. We're doing that in about 31% of the cases in total across all cases being given. I actually think that's a fairly pessimistic number. And part of what's happened in this first year of launch is we're getting samples that couldn't be diagnosed by anything else. So every now and then we're finding a diagnosis in something that probably should have been thought of along the way, but wasn't. Uh, and yet we're, we're sort of depleting patients who might have a more clear and easy route to, to uh, a genetically heterogeneous condition. We're also finding about 20% of the cases with a variant of unknown significance where you can't truly say it's absolutely clear-cut clear causal but there's sufficient information that this is, uh, that this is uh, very interesting. Some of these are actually novel gene discoveries. So that blend of being able to do gene discovery in the context of doing clinical work is actually quite exciting and one of the reasons that I'd like to push this forward. It doesn't mean that we're doing research on those patients' samples. It means that it's an output that one gets where you can actually find the causal mutation um, with a novel gene discovery in the context of trying to do the appropriate molecular diagnosis. But that still leaves us with this very big set down here where we find no significant finding in about 50%. Just where we are with the work that's going on at the University of Washington and across the multiple different uh, genomic centers, uh, as novel genes are found, of course, uh, many of these with a clear diagnosis will be able to be ascribed with a specific mutation causing a specific phenotype because uh, the number of genes will, that will be identified will, will grow. Uh, 
So I want to walk through a few cases that I think are uh, demonstrative of the process. And this is a patient that uh, came to UCLA after seeing uh, three or four other different neurologists, developmental neurologists or geneticists. And uh, he had a fairly normal early uh, onset. And by six months, he was not able to roll over and not able to sit and had actually rather severe constipation. So the mother was quite concerned um, and also was told that maybe he had some unusual facial features, but the mom said pretty much just look like me and my husband. Uh, so it was discounted by them as being family uh, resemblance, which having seen pictures of the boy, I would do as well. Uh, but I'm no dysmorphologist. Uh, eight months, he was still not rolling or sitting. So for anybody who's a pediatrician in the audience or anybody who's had kids, this is wildly abnormal. It was really quite off the developmental uh, trajectory. He had some head control, <clears throat> but he would not or could not grab at toys from a seated position. And by 12 months, he still had very similar uh, delay in his gross motor function. And he was uh, considered for a variety of different genetic conditions and was, uh, Derek Wong discussed with them doing a clinical exome sequencing as a trio, so the mother, the father, and the child were all sequenced, even though it really wasn't clear what the diagnosis was. A number of things were bandied about because he smiled and seemed pretty happy. Angelman syndrome was considered, Fragile X was considered, Hirschsprung disease. A number of different uh, terms were put into the chart. Various tests had already been performed in his very young uh, life, but no real primary diagnosis was forthcoming. I'll give you a perspective from the mom who I talked to after we established the diagnosis, which I'll tell you in a second. Her perspective was she saw four neurologists. Three told her he's probably normal, just kind of a little slow. One told us it's probably going to be pretty serious. So. Three out of four neurologists agree that it wasn't going to be so serious. So in her mind, heading into exome sequencing, she was thinking, yeah, this probably isn't going to be a big deal. They'll probably not find it, because that's what our medical community had told her, right? That's what the, ex uh, the experts leading into this had, had told her. So we used a set of primary uh, words, and of course, uh, keywords, and of course, one of them is developmental delay, which has uh, hundreds and hundreds of different genes affiliated with uh, that can lead to developmental delay. We found a heterozygous mutation, which I'm sure is difficult to see, but is here at this position, which is in a splice uh, donor site in the child and is absent from the mother and absent from the father, both of uh, many hundreds of reads, indicating that, the that they both have the reference allele and the child has this de novo allele. Very clear, convincing de novo genetic finding. It turns out to be uh, a splice acceptor site in TCF4, which should lead to haploinsufficiency. Haploinsufficiency, other mutations, about 150 have been described, most of them leading to uh, nonsense mutations or splice site mutations and leading to uh, heterozygous mutations and leading to haploinsufficiency of TCF4, cause a disease called Pitt-Hopkins syndrome, which, actually I took the clinical slide out, which, uh, would predict that the child may indeed never speak and may indeed never walk, a very severe uh, neurodevelopmental uh, disorder. But even with that diagnosis, this is mother's response in discussing this uh, case with her. And <clears throat> she, uh, you know, life changes for patients when you give them a genetic diagnosis. It's, it's, it's a before and after event. And that's true for this mom as well. She knew she had a child with a very serious disease. She didn't know what its name was. She didn't know what the issues were. She didn't know what the predictive course was going to be because nobody could give her that. And at the end of it, and, you know, obviously after being sent into the initial uh, shock of this, she was thankful that at least a molecular diagnosis was made and you could move forward with a clear idea of how life would proceed and maybe how she might be able to alter some of that, that disease course through uh, either um, you know, uh, more focused education, uh, physical therapy, et cetera. So I think that's a common perspective amongst uh, the recipients of some of this information. And it becomes more common, I think, the younger folks are diagnosed. So I think there's going to be a push to try to do these things earlier, at least uh, in my, my belief, and I'd be happy to discuss that with others. So if you just to focus on this one issue of developmental delay, there's over a thousand different genes, mutations in which lead to some aspect of developmental delay. And with the over 4,000 different genetic diseases for which the mutation is known, it makes a very complex sort of search space problem. But I think we have the tools to do a decent job at getting to many of these diagnoses. Where I think this is going to be, and Les Biesecker has 
sort of mentioned this as well in his talks, is that I think what we're going to move towards is a process where we put uh, sequencing in much earlier in the diagnostic uh, process. That is, instead of performing the initial physical examination, family history, et cetera, and then a series of imaging, possibly biopsy, phenotypic evaluations, I believe we're gonna move towards a world where we're all gonna want to have exome sequencing, very thorough genomic sequencing, and genetic analysis much earlier, but it's gonna change the paradigm rather substantially. In the case that we talked about at our genomic board, we didn't get into it much, but as an example of that, we genetically diagnosed that child. We did not phenotypically diagnose that child. So that child has a ZEB2 mutation, has Moat-Wilson syndrome as far as I'm concerned, but he's in a sense a novel individual, unique individual with Moat-Wilson uh, syndrome and contributes to the discussion of what's the phenotypic heterogeneity of people with mutations in that gene. That's the world we're gonna be living in. We're going to do genetic diagnosis and then overlapping the phenotype, which happens as we clone each new disease gene. We sequence the genes, we find novel mutations, we change what that clinical uh, heterogeneity of the spectrum is, which has happened for Pitt Hopkins uh, as well. Uh, a second case I'm gonna run through very quickly. It was a case that was brought to us by one of our uh, neurologists here, Mar uh, Martina Wade Pezos who works in the uh, neuromuscular program. And uh, she brought to us a child who is 18-year-old female of Persian descent, where the parents were known to be first cousins once removed, and this child had a diagnosis of juvenile ALS on the basis of upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron signs, and it was very slowly progressive. <clears throat> and she uh, really couldn't figure out what, it, what the disease was, but she knew that there were some genes that lead to juvenile ALS so we plucked out the set of, of known disease genes that can lead possibly to some uh, component of ALS and possibly some of these could have mutations that were leading to a juvenile form. Uh, some were feasible, some were infeasible. We actually found uh, a variant in SCTX, which as Brent had indicated he discovered years ago, and it actually has a 1.5 percent allele frequency, so it could be very easily vetted and discarded as not being an important mutation for this disease process. And in the process of the genomic data board, uh, looking at the regions of the genome that are homozygous in this individual, which are large homozygous stretches, so the regions of, of identity by descent, uh, <clears throat> led our discussion to a gene that was actually outside of our primary gene list. We weren't considering this gene, but this gene here, AAAS, is a homozygous nonsense mutation within a large homozygous interval manifested by the, by the uh, consanguinity and it is uh, defects in AAS are reported to cause recessive achalasia, adansonianism, elacroma syndrome, or triple AS, triple A syndrome, which is phenotypically heterogeneous, and a component, a substantial component of those individuals actually have a juvenile onset, progressive spinal bulbar amyotrophy, and neuropathies as well, which actually fits this child's conditions very well. So this is an example of, we have the genetic diagnosis, we go back to the physician, who actually came to the genomic data board, the data is very convincing, and said, we believe this child probably has AAA syndrome, which of course none of us had heard about before we did this case, uh, which is common in these sorts of genetic diagnoses. And on re-examination, the child indeed had no tears, had a lacrima, uh, had a surgery performed for achalasia at age 15, so has two of the A's, doesn't end up having adansonianism, actually has normal uh, cortisol. Uh, but has peripheral neuropathy and has uh, ataxia uh, and uh, uh, issues. So this child's diagnosis was fundamentally changed and adds to the spectrum of the clinical heterogeneity of the mutations in AAAS. That's the route that we're on, and that's what the new world of genetics is going to look like. Uh, this case I'm going to scoot through very quickly. So a, a, a young infant with a progressive, uncontrolled, migrating complex partial seizure is very serious and severe and uh, referred to us from the neurology, uh, pediatric neurology group here. He ends up having a de novo heterozygous variant uh, at, at uh, residue 474, arginine dehistidine in KCNT1. At the time that this was done, no mutations were present in HGMD, OMEM, KCNT1 was not a disease gene. So we talked about this case in September, 
And in the ASHG abstracts was where de novo gain of function mutations in KC and T1 mutations caused developmental delay and seizures, malignant migrating partial seizures of infancy, which describes this child very well. Paper comes out in October, and those results can then be returned right back to the patients. That's the, space at which, that's the pacing at which we're doing this. And as Mike had mentioned, the amount of discovery that's yet to be done is probably exceeds what's gone on. And it's going to be, oh, thank you. And it's going to be uh, important to keep up with this. To me, this is the single best argument for not doing panels and doing genomic tests is to push to be in this world so that you can more readily reinterpret the data very quickly and also not necessarily uh, be within a given uh, diagnostic category. So the final bit that I just would touch on, this is a research fun finding that uh, Hain, Hain Lee did in collaboration with Tobias uh, Willer, who's a postdoc in Kevin Campbell's lab with Stephen Moore at the University of Iowa. And uh, in this, she identified ISPD loss of mutations as a novel genetic cause of Walker-Warburg syndrome, which is an alpha uh, district lichenopathy. Um, so it affects OMAN oscillation as the specific defect that ISPD is doing. So a novel gene finding. It went through a fairly standard fashion. So the idea here was that Hain was able to do various linkage and identify a subset of patients that were all linked to a given region. In that region were a series of different mutations in ISPD, clear, compelling evidence of multiple different independent recessive mutations in this gene. So this is very robustly uh, done. But what gives me pause here is, you know, the, the, the paper is accurate, totally fine, this is real. Um, but what to, to, uh, Tobias has been able to show is that there's multiple different complementation groups uh, where unknown individuals with uh, dystroglycanopathies uh, do not necessarily fit to any of the known disease genes. So there, was, there were, when we were doing this work, one, two, three, four, five, six different known disease genes for a relatively rare syndrome, Walker-Warburg syndrome. Uh, Toby had ident identified that there were one, two, three, four, five additional genes to be found because of the complementation assay. We and another group simultaneously found <coughs> the uh, mutations for this largest complementation group, which is now this ISPD1. These are a set of unresolved cases. Uh, there's a series of mutations. Some of these we know, others we, we, we don't know for these other complementation groups. But half of all patients with the very rare Walker-Warburg syndrome still go without a diagnosis. And that translates to every single one of these, actually inside each one of these groups, there's one patient inside that group. It's a unique group, very rare now, right? So we have the luxury here of having a complementation assay. So when we find the next Walker-Warburg syndrome gene, we can prove it genetically. And that's not true for a number of the other different diseases that we're looking at. That is, we're gonna have ends of one, a novel mutation in a new gene, and we won't be able to prove it necessarily without that functional validation. So, so my final uh, comments that I wanted to make about this is the interpretation limitations on what we do in clinical exome sequencing. I'm actually pleased that we ended up setting up the genomic data board, which is a brainchild really probably more of a uh, Eric Belain and Wayne Grody than, than me. I, I tend to go alone <laughs> to these things. Um, but it's actually, it's an incredibly useful enterprise. It's an ongoing active learning enterprise for all of us. And uh, the thing that's very humbling is, you know, the input that we get is critically important and absolutely alters our interpretation. So phenotyping is, is demonstrably a very important aspect of, the, of this process. And the more we can do this, the better. I'm not optimistic that we could necessarily collect those data a priori and up front in a way that would be most uh, effective. And I think this will be an ongoing conversation. And the means and the tools for having that interactive discussion, I think, are, are, are not necessarily adequately developed. But we're trying to make a shot at what we're doing. And it sounds like the same thing is being uh, observed in multiple other areas. We have a quite a large list of potentially damaging uh, rare variants per patient. And interpreting them remains a challenge, but in many instances, we can come up with a very clear uh, diagnosis. I think we, as a, as, a, as a medical profession, we need to move towards what would help me a lot is if we had a common medical vocabulary. If we all said the same thing and meant the same thing when we said it, 
as doctors. It would be incredibly useful here. And you know, I think we need to do that uh, across this world, partly because we're going to have an enormous informatics challenge of trying to uh, discuss even the clinical he heterogeneity of these patients across the many thousands of different uh, mutations. And diagnosing those kids as they come in will be less challenging if we can rely on what we, what we call patients. So final conclusions, I would say after the first year of this test, it's routine, it's very reliable, the data are highly accurate, the tools are, are robust. Uh, there's a very high likelihood but it, of, of success but in uh, a, a minority of the patients end up getting a very clear diagnosis at the end, but that uh, actually an acceptable and very good diagnostic yield. Uh, improvements in the quality of sequencing or the amount of sequencing, even the cost of sequencing, aren't gonna be C changes anymore. I think Mike is right, the C change has already occurred. It's here in clinic, it's a reasonable test, and it's not a budget-busting test. And it replaces a lot of other testing that we've been doing. So that's an exciting place to be, and even as it's being run now, it changes how we should move forward with, with genetics heading into the future and will further do that. I believe it's actually an outstanding early screening tool, an early diagnostic tool, and I believe we'll come to appreciate that more and more uh, over time, and it will, it will change the workflow that we do in genetics clinics and in various uh, subspecialty uh, clinics. I also further believe that we'll do a fair amount of gene discovery in clinical practice using this, but only if we can come up with sort of this fairly common medical vocabulary and joining of data from multiple different uh, institutions. We're not in the future yet of doing pre-symptomatic screening for these cases. So that's not a use that we're doing. It's not a use that we're advocating. It's not an area that we're pushing uh, at this time, although obviously there'll be a demand for that. So I'm gonna stop there with just listing probably a subset of all the collaborators in this. Thank you very much. Thank you.